Everybody's had a good week. We're here at God's house this morning. Uh, they always put me to do this, and I don't like it at all, for real. But welcome to Catawba Heights Baptist Church. Y'all please stand and worship with us. Sometimes on this journey, 
get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over My story's just begun And failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does And failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does
you are our great defender. You pick up all our pieces, God. The mess we make. God, and you clean it up, Lord. You go before us. We praise you. We thank you for who you are. opportunity to worship you. God, and we, as we listen to your word, Lord, I pray that we will take what we learn and Lord, we will live it out this week. Let's give the Lord another hand. What do you think? Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Happy uh, February 14th. Somebody says, why do you say that? Well, I've always been terrible at Valentine's. My wife will tell you. So I get up on Valentine's Day and do nothing but apologize all day. And that's what I've been doing in the back back there. So sorry. Valentine's Day is tough, man, tough, really is. What's so tough about it? All that chocolate. I am thankful that you're here, really am, and uh, appreciate your presence. Uh, and this is a, you know, believe it or not, this is a great day for a lot of people, but it is a hard day for a lot of people. I'm just going to be honest with you, it really is. And I get texts from that, man, it's a tough day for me. And it has to do a lot of things with family. People lost family members and other things. It just reminds them of it. But today, I'm going to be talking about marriage developing a love that lasts. Uh, and it don't matter if you're married or not because the principles will apply and do apply to every single believer in Christ. Uh, it has to, the principles can be applied to your relationship with other brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ, in the church. But I'm going to be zero in a men, in particularly on marriage. And, uh, and so I, I want to talk about that. And, you know, marriage is in a tough spot. It's been redefined here in America a couple of times. And there are a lot of young ones that are kind of opting out of marriage, uh, you know, as such, trying other arrangements as it is. But marriage is God's design. He's the one that created it, designed it, and uh, gave us his intentions for it. And it's been a beautiful thing to me, uh, just unfortunately at funerals here lately, but I've uh, met couples that have been married for a long time, 60 and 70 years. It's been an amazing kind of thing. And uh, so I'm very thankful for those who have endured um, you know, although statistically, as I said, it, it seems like for the young, for young ones, they're getting married later now in their thirties versus their, their teens and twenties. A lot of them, uh, 96% of the people in America will eventually get married still. Uh, and out of that 96%, 39%, uh, eventually divorce. And uh, of those who divorce, 79% of those get remarried. And out of those that remarry, 44% of them get a divorce. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've married hundreds of couples. And I've yet to have a couple sit down and say, Pastor Raymond, I'd just like for you to, you know, appreciate your work with our vows and everything. But we also know that probably about five, maybe 10 years uh, this thing's going to go south. So could you help us with divorce, how to, how to go about that? Uh, I've never had anybody to sit down and say, you know, we have, we're, we're probably going to divorce. Um, could you give us some pointers? We need a lawyer or whatever. Uh, I've never had anybody 
get married with a plan to divorce. It, it takes us a lot of times by surprise. It's not a planned thing. And we could spend a lot of time on why marriages die. We could, we could do that. Uh, but I'm more interested in what makes marriage last. Now, I tell every couple that I uh, am going to marry who come together, first of all, I want to know, do you know Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord? Because I do believe with all my heart and soul, having done this for 37 years, that it is essential that you know Jesus Christ and he is Lord of your life and Lord of your marriage. I believe that with all my heart. But having said that, many of us know people who probably that don't uh, know Jesus and they've been married a long time. Uh, but being married and existing in the ha same house with people is not the same thing. And I can tell you that I, one occasion, I, I think I'd been married 60 years and Jan was talking about it, my wife, and I, it may have been 50, but I think it was, it was 50 or 60, a lady and her husband who were uh, not believers, and I was in the home talking with her, and I said, man, what, you know, what's, the, what's going on with this marriage you got? You mean, look here, 60 years you've been married. She said, yeah. I said, well, what, what's about that? She said, I'm just going to outlive this mean snake of a man He's not beating me down. He's not making me leave. He's not going to put me out. I'm going to outlive him, and I'm going to stay married to him just to spite him. Okie dokie. That's what you call existing. That's not having anything to do with marriage uh, as it is. But what I'm saying today, as I said, is general truths of God's Word that apply across the board to all believers. But I'm talking particularly under marriages because there are a lot of people uh, who are struggling in that. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I want to look at least six practices from God's Word, uh, believers who practice. These are practices that believers should be practicing from God's Word that are true, as I said, for all Christ followers that build lasting relationships with other believers, but in particularly within the marriage. The first one is found in Romans 15, verse 7. Romans 15, 7, first practice. Uh, and that practice is this. We must accept uh, one another as Christ has accepted you. Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Romans 15, 7 says that. Paul says there, accept one another then just as Christ has accepted you, and look at the reason, in order to bring praise to God. That's the reason we do it, brothers and sisters. That's the reason we do it in a marriage. That word accept one another, if I can take it a little bit further and expand it in what it was saying in the original, means to receive and to grant someone access to your heart. That means I'm going to accept them to the point that I'm going to open myself up and receive them uh, in my heart. Uh, and how is that? Just as Christ has accepted you. In other words, our attitude toward others, and in particular our wife or our husband, must flow from the transformation that has taken place in us, in Jesus, when we by faith turn from our sins and trusted in him as Savior and Lord. It's, a, it's something we must understand, uh, that he accepted us. Uh, look at Romans 5, 8, and I'm going to look at verse 10 as well. Romans 5, 8, listen to what he says. Paul says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God didn't say, listen to me, get your life in order, get everything in order. I want you to uh, get everything moving in the right direction, clean yourself up, do all these things. And once you do, I'm going to accept you and, and, and I'll save you. He didn't say that. He said, even while we are yet sinners, even while we're still living on our own, even while we're not worthy of his mercy and his grace, Jesus died for you and me. And he made it possible for us to know him. Verse 10, he says, 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled shall we be saved by his life. He said, man, for, for while we were enemies. And some of you may say, well, I never was an enemy of God. Yeah, you were. Outside of Jesus Christ, every single person is living for themselves. Every single person is living for themselves. Just can tell you, we're living a life our way. We do what we want to do, how we want to do it, the way we want to do it. And that is at odds with what God has for us as far as he is concerned for us to do. And so that as Christ has accepted you and me, we are to do that. How much more should it be true, actually, of us who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb to love and accept our spouses, our husband, our wife, that we loved enough in the first place to get married. We ought to be able to accept them in that way. And this is a very, impo this is very important in marriage for those of us who are believers in Christ because the fact is about 70% of us marry people that are opposite of us. And they're, we're just, we're different in that. There are differences. And I've seen that throughout the years. I'm just telling you it is. And it, it's an amazing thing that what attracts us initially together is after you get married, suddenly becomes an irritation. And sometimes it's an irritation before you get home from the honeymoon. Trust me, <laughs> I've been there, done it, seen it. You're not even home, man. Uh, can we have an appointment? What's up? Oh, man, I'm you, I didn't know he was that way. It's differences, that's, that's what it is. Is, is when you begin to live together in the same house 24 7 and you begin to discover that uh, and, and it's it's funny I mean it really is to be able to look he, he puts one, he puts us together one of them wants to go to bed with the with the crack of uh, the sunset going down right there and the other still up at midnight you know wanting to, to have a party uh, one wants to get up at three o'clock in the morning and eat breakfast and go on about their life. And the other one's wanting to sleep till noon. You know what I'm saying? I was noticed on Facebook, there's these people doing these. Some of you may have done it. You put it on there where we met and who kissed first and all this kind of stuff. And then it says on there, uh, who spends the most money? You know, and it's funny to watch that because some people say, he does. You know, you can tell by the way they type that word in, he does or she does. You can tell, man, they really resent that. He does, she does. And then you've got those saintly couples. We both do. Liar. <laughs> it's just amazing to me how it looks like that. And you got the intimacy. You, in, in intimacy, you got one that says drop everything, and the other one says drop dead, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's kind of crazy. But the truth is, our differences. is, uh, are not wrong our difference is just different and, and that's important for us to know two people can be different and neither of them wrong the question is do you accept your husband's or wife's differences as Christ has accepted yours you see acceptance is essential to marriage because there's no perfect people in a marriage all of us are imperfect people we all ha uh, need lots of acceptance and Christ has shown his love he's accepted us he's accepted you and he's accepted me with all our quirks with all our tendencies and through him and the Holy Spirit in us we're to practice accepting others as he has accepted us uh, and it's a powerful thing to be able to do. Romans 14, 13, uh, I, I translated this this way, um, and it, I think it's doggone accurate from what it says. But Romans 14, 13 says this, let us no longer live in the, uh, or have the habit of criticizing one another. Let us no longer have the habit of criticizing one another another so you see without acceptance without accepting others as Jesus has accepted us 
we end, end up criticizing our marriage to death. We end up criticizing our marriage to death. And so we've got to learn to accept one another even as Christ has accepted us. The second uh, practice that we need from God's Word uh, is we need to spend time with one another consistently. Spend time with one another consistently. We all need that time and attention. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23, Peter says this. He says, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere friend love for each other. Now, that friend love is my translation. And the reason I translate it becomes from, it comes from the Greek word for friend, love for friends. We've messed up friendship in our culture. It's hard to be friends in there with, unless you're friends with benefits. That's, that's the word that I hear all the time, friends with benefits. No, the friends were highly valued, and it was a love. And that love says it is more about I like you. I like everything about you, and I, because I like you, I like spending time with you. I like hanging out with you. I like doing things with you. That, that was the friend love. And so I use that translation. But he says, so that you show sincere friend love to each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly because you've been born again. Why? Because you've been born again. Why? Because you've been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. And some 16 times, I think it is in the New Testament, that the phrase love one another is used. So what does that mean? Well, I think you spell a love T-I-M-E is how you spell love. I really do. Uh, if you love somebody, you want to spend time with them. Uh, you don't want to just endure them. You want to spend time with them. Everybody needs and desires time with those they love. When I was a little kid, my dad worked two or three jobs. And I would ask him, I said, Dad, Daddy, will you go out in the backyard with me and throw a baseball or throw a football? He said, I've got to go to work. I said, well, Daddy, you work all the time. He said, yeah, but I'm only working so that you can have the things you need. And I remember saying to him directly, I said, Daddy, I don't want those things you're working to give me. I want you. And I want you to come in the backyard with me and throw baseball. Later on, after he had been gone 12 years and nobody knew where he was, he made contact with me. And I'd arranged for him to meet me in 1994, and I wanted to introduce him to his granddaughters he had not seen. And uh, one day he called me. His neighbor later told me it was a guilt call because he said he had talked to him on his porch, and he was really down because he had, I'm an only child, and I was his only son. And he just left, and he did it in a bad, poor way. It really was. And I missed him, and I tried to find him for 12 years. It took me a long time. But he called me. Guilt call or not, he called me. He said, son, just want to let you know something. I said, well, hey, Daddy, what's going on? He said, well, I just want to know. I took out a life insurance policy and made you the sole beneficiary. And I remember saying to my daddy on that phone, I said, Daddy, thank you for thinking about me, but I don't want your money. I want you. Daddy, I don't want your money. I want you. I want you to sit down with me and two granddaughters that you've not met. I want you to see them. I want you to talk to them. I want you to get to see the daddy I know. I just want to spend the day with you. That's all I want. Unfortunately, before that time came, he died of a heart attack. And uh, that never got to happen. And uh, he canceled, I guess he canceled the life insurance policy. and never got it, but guess what? I didn't want it. When I said I didn't want it, I meant I didn't want it because the most important thing to me was I wanted him. Time is how you spell love. I, I believe that with all my heart and all my soul. Do you, much, you remember how much time you spent if you were dating somebody you love? How much time you, you spent with them when you were dating? How much time you wanted to spend? Listen, I couldn't get enough time in. I met Janet when she was 15. I was, I mean, I'm telling you, man. If they had a meal, I was somewhere out like a dog somewhere ready for them to throw me a piece of meat because I was around there all the time. But I remember one night, I dropped her off at her house. It was about midnight, and it was her curfew at that time, and so I dropped her off. 
and I was almost home, and I got thinking, doggone, man, I need, one, I need to see her one more time. I just want to be with her. So I turned around and went back up the house, parked my car on Hickory Grove Road and walked down to her backyard, and I walked down there and had me a, some rocks, you know, and I was just, her windows way up because it was built on a hill, and I just throwing things like that, ping, ping, ping. She finally came. She looked out and saw me. She opened up that door, opened the window. I said, she said, what are you doing here? I said, I couldn't stand it. I want to talk to you some more. By that time, her daddy come out in his underwear with a shotgun. And, it, and I said, don't shoot me, don't shoot me, Mr. Lee. It's me, Raymond Jones. She said, Raymond Jones, what in the world are you doing out at my house at this time of night? You better get in that car and I'm going to count to three and you better be gone. I was gone. I don't know if you went to that extremes or not, but I'm going to tell you something. When you love somebody, you want to be with them. You want to be there with them. You want to be, give them some time. And if you compare how we were when we were dating to how we are now, sometimes it's ridiculous how that's changed. Why, why is that, you know? Well, we're not that giddy couple. We, we've matured. No, I don't think so. I think you've begun to settle into a routine that can be deadly. We, we, we must be spending time with each other consistently. You see, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. I think one of the worst forms of rejection is to be ignored. Uh, we all need time and attention. And... Uh, God even tells us men that uh, that is true as well. Uh, it can hinder our prayer life. Listen to what he has to say in 1 Peter 3, 7. And this is more my translation than it is anything else, but uh, I think it's pretty accurate. The same goes for you husbands. Be good husbands to your wives. Honor them. Delight in them as women. They lack some of your advantages. But in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. Treat your wives as precious then, as equal heirs, so your prayers don't run aground or don't fall or don't fail. And the reality is that God expects us to honor, as husbands, honor and delight in our wives. If you look at those terms, those terms require someone to spend time with that person. And if you don't spend time with them, and honor them and take delight in them, as he says, treating them as precious. He says, your prayers are grounded. They're grounded. That's how much love and time are connected. So we accept one another as Christ has accepted us. We spend time with each other, uh, loving each other from the depths of our heart. The third practice biblically is we must be willing to submit to one another now uh, you know it's a it's a difficult thing sometimes when we look at uh, scripture uh, we we don't realize the Greek New Testament in the original language had no verses or had no chapters those were all added by translation so sometimes it's kind of difficult and, and you get a break in things and so we have in Ephesians chapter 5 we have this fabulous um, passage on marriage where men, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and women should be submissive unto their husbands and that's been worked to death. But we leave Ephesians 5, 21 out as not a part of that passage. And let me just read this passage to you. Ephesians 5, 21 says this. Submit to one another, uh-oh, Submit to one another out of reverence to God, to Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence or honor to Christ. That means there is a mutual adjusting. Submission means to adjust. So we're adjusting to one another. Uh, it, it, it says submit to one another, and people will beat that thing to death the woman's got to be a thing. Yeah, there's a lot about men leadership and women following that leadership, but I'm telling you that the Scripture as a whole in the context says, submit one to another 
and honor Christ. And that submission is our mutual adjustment to each other as we grow in our relationship. But here's the problem that I see. The problem is that we get so busy trying to change our husband or our wife that we don't have time to look at what we need to change. We, we're so busy wanting to change him or change her that we don't ha realize we, we've got some things we need to work on. We need to work on. And so what happens is you have people that are sitting down and say, well, once we get married, he'll change. Or, you know, after we get married, uh, I can change him. Folks, let me remind you of something. You can't change anybody. Only God can change a human heart. Only God can change a human personality. But people go ahead and get married, and they start this what I call personal development program in which for their, for their husband or wife, and they start regularly trying to mold and shape and even cracking the whip to make sure they toe the line. And then when they resent it, would we'll say, I don't know what's wrong with you. I'm doing this for your own good. Some people can't adjust or don't want to adjust, and they divorce and remarry. And the fact is, the longer you live, the more set in your ways you're going to become, and more often than not, in that second marriage, you're going to be even more stubborn and more unwilling to change. And it creates a cycle because you've not ever, you've not dealt with transformation here. And that's where it begins. You see, immaturity and selfishness ruin the majority of marriages that end. Immaturity and selfishness. Immaturity and selfishness means that you both are stubborn and unwilling to change. It's my way or the highway. Unwilling to change. And, and it, it means you're both selfish. You're both not willing to work at it. That's the epitome of sin. S, what's that middle letter? I, N. Sin is about self, and it destroys marriages. But this is what Romans 14, 19 says. Paul says, so then let us pursue, chase what promotes peace and builds up one another. Let us chase after that that promotes peace and builds up one another. That's what, that's what God expects us to do, is to look after those things, to be willing to adjust to each other. And in adjusting, we need to be able to chase after or pursue the things that promote peace within the relationship and builds the other person up. So we are to accept and we are to spend time with one another and we are to be willing um, to submit or adjust to one another. And then this fourth practice is we forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. I'm just telling you, both generally for non-married, but for those who are married, man, you just need to call a truce. It has got to come a halt here. God calls us to total forgiveness. Uh, you, you can't make it in a marriage without forgiveness. You can't make it in life without forgiveness. You've got to have a lot of forgiving going on in a marriage. You, you really do. It, it, it's there. Forgiveness is, is, is a necessity. It, it's a powerful, powerful thing. To be able to think about this i mean resentment and unforgiveness will kill a marriage quicker than anything and, and you need forgiveness everybody hurts each other uh, sometimes it's on purpose that's called maliciousness or malice in the scripture and it's a sin sometimes it's unintentionally just not thinking or about what you're doing or saying but the fact is is when you live close to somebody you're going to hurt them. And you have two options to do with your hurt. Two options. One is you can rehearse it. You go over it and over it and over it. This is what he did to me. This is what he did to me. This is what he did to me. This is what she did to me. This is what she did to me. And you rehearse it. 
And you know the more you rehearse it, the bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger it gets. And let me tell you what happens. Unforgiveness and resentment build you a prison. It doesn't build the person you're resenting or unforgiving toward a prison. It builds you a prison. So that nobody can get close to you because your bitterness and your resentment and your unforgiveness is a poison. It's what it is. So you can rehearse it and it's just going to be bigger till it dominates the, the entirety of your life. Or in Christ, you can release it. And, and you can forgive. You can forgive. And, and so you, you've got to ask yourself, you know, you let it go. Well, that's easier for you to say, I, you just don't know what's happened. Well, I know there's a lot of tragedies happen. Forgiveness is not for them, it's for you. We're not talking about reconciliation. That's something you ought to pursue with other believers. But we're talking about forgiveness, getting yourself out of the prison. Well, I just can't forgive. Well, let me just, let me share something with you here, why this is. And, and, and it'll become more evident uh, as we go through here. And that's this. God said in his word, if you don't forgive on earth, I'm not going to forgive in heaven. That doesn't mean, you might be hearing you say, I'm a believer. You mean if I don't forgive, I'm, I'm going to lose my salvation? No, I'm going to tell you why. Because what God is saying is, if you can't forgive on earth, you've never experienced my forgiveness. You've never experienced it. I'm going to tell you why. He tells parables about it. Here's one for you. Jesus telling a parable. He said, one time there's this man owed a king a million dollars, and he couldn't pay it. So the king says, bring him in. He comes in. He says, I know I owe you a million dollars. Please, please don't send me to prison. Please don't do anything. To my, don't sell my wife and kids off to make money. Please have mercy on me. He says, I forgive you. million dollars. Bam. He's just elated, man. He's excited. Jesus says he walks out, starts down the steps. He sees this man that owes him 10 bucks. He goes up by over and grabs him by the nap of the neck and says, I want my $10 and I want it now. I don't have it. I said, give me my $10. I don't have it. He drags him down to what's called a debtor's prison where they put people to owe debts that they hadn't paid. And he threw him in there. And he threw his family in there. Which kind of sounds stupid, don't it? Because now they can't make no money to pay you back anyway. But he did. So the, guy, the people are watching. They said, they run into the king. They said, Let's what? guess what? You know that man that owed you a million dollars? Yeah. You forgave him? Yeah, I did. He just ran up to a friend of his that owed him 10 bucks. And he had him and his family thrown in, in the prison down there because he didn't, wouldn't give him his 10 bucks. He called him back in here called him back in there and he says so I forgive you a million dollars and you can't give ten throw him into the prison and let him stay there until he's paid every dime what's that have to do with anything your sin that we talked about in Romans a moment ago your sin and my sin every person on this planet sin against God that it, that when we're lost is like us owing a trillion dollars we owe a debt we can't pay. So what's God do? He sends his only begotten son. We trust him and his sacrifice on the cross. We receive forgiveness of that debt. We become a part of his family and we have eternal life. And compared, there is no comparison between what this person, no matter how bad it is, did to me and my sin against God. So God says, if you can't understand the, hu you, the hugeness of your debt that I forgave you, and you can't remember that, and instead you hold unforgiveness here, you've never really experienced mine. That's what he's saying. So when you say, I can't forgive, that's not true. You're afraid they're going to get away with something. But listen to me, forgiveness means I'm going to break free from my prison. I'm letting this go into God's hands. He'll be their judge. 
He'll take care of things. I'm going to live my life for the glory of God. And if you don't do that in your, in general, I'm telling you, churches are destroyed because of unforgiveness of believer against believer. It's amazing to me. So it's a general principle, but it's also a great principle, a, an unmistakably great principle in a marriage. You must let go of the resentment and the unforgiveness. It's necessary because resentment only hurts you. It doesn't hurt the person you're resenting. It's like throwing a boomerang. Bam! Oh, God. You know, you're like, wow. Bam! How many times you got to get hit in the head before you realize, I'm not throwing that thing no more. Let it go. You can only do that when you trust Christ enough to do it. And when you've experienced that forgiveness of that trillion dollar debt that you owe and you can't pay, and all of a sudden Jesus said, that's all right, I took care of the debt, don't worry about it. That's a great feeling. And you mean you can't turn around? It's, well, you just don't know. Well, do you know what you've been forgiven of? You've got to remember that. So that's what it brings us to. What do you do? You remember that resentment and unforgiveness hurts you more. Remember that God has forgiven you. Listen to Colossians 3, 12 and 13. Colossians 3, 12 and 13. He says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. You've been forgiven, so you ought to forgive. Him. So we need to remember how much we have been forgiven uh, and, and know God's grace to us and extend that to, to our husband or our wife as well in general to other believers. The fifth practice for a love that will last a lifetime, though, is we need to show appreciation and speak encouragement to one another regularly. To show appreciation and speak encouragement to one another regularly. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this, Therefore, encourage one another. Encourage one another. We're to accept one another. We're to submit, adjust to one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, build each other up. Um, and, and that's exactly what he tells us. The most encouraging thing you can do is to express thankfulness, appreciation, and encouragement. Everybody needs to be appreciated. Everybody needs appreciation. The power of praise is awesome. I mean, think about it in the terms of worship. God inhabits the what of his people? Praises. It's the same thing here that, that people need that. It, it's much more effective than criticizing. Some, someone said, don't nag, brag. And so, you know, you appreciate. People blossom under affirmation. I've seen children who've been brought up in abusive, non-loving environments be taken out and placed in an environment where people love them and, and uh, affirm them by their words, and I've seen them just come alive. I mean, it's alive. I've seen it right here in this church. I've seen it. Where do they just come alive? I've got notes from some of them that one day when they're grown, I'm going to show them the notes they wrote me. Just, and they didn't even realize how powerful it was, what they were saying, when before you couldn't get them to say nothing. But they had been around people who loved them and appreciated them, and they began to blossom. To appreciate means to raise the value, right? You raise the value. When your home appreciates, it raises in value. If it depreciates, it, it, it goes down. And when you depreciate something, you put it down, you devalue it. So whenever you appreciate your wife or your husband, you're actually increasing their value. Appreciation is really a very powerful tool in marriage because it does three things. One, it raises your husband or wife's value it raises your own value and thirdly it raises the value of your relationship and, and there's too many listen there's too many depreciators in this world uh, the world is full of people who put you down and it's getting worse day by day and the last thing you need is that at home it really is 
There, there are a lot more critics out there in the world than there are compliments. Uh, so acceptance is when you say, I accept you in spite of your faults. Uh, this submission says, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to meet you halfway. I'm willing to make an effort. I'm willing to work on my part. That, that's what that says. But appreciation says, you know, I not only accept you, but I find things in you that I like, and, and I find something that's good, that's significant. And the Bible says that we're to encourage one another through appreciation. And we can do that. Is it hard? Uh, some of us are going to have to be real creative. I mean, really and truly. It, it, it's there. It's just, it, it, we've got to get to that point, though, of appreciation. I, I told a story, some of you may have heard me tell it, but when early on I used to give couples that came from the account some pencils and paper, and I would say, write down the thing that you don't like about your husband or wife. And I've, uh, that you like, rather, about your husband or wife. And I've seen them eat the eraser and chew the eraser. I've seen them bite the wood on the pencil. I mean, this pencil get through it, look like a beaver had been on them things. You know what I'm saying? And they wouldn't write a thing. And then I said, okay, now write the thing you don't like. And it was like, can you sharpen this pencil again? You know? And, and after three pages, I'm just like, hey, that's enough. Nah, right, right, three pages. It's too easy to talk about those things that we don't like, but it takes a word, and some of us have to do that. You know, you mean to tell me that there's nothing in the world that you like about him? Well, he whistles, and I said, listen, dude, whistle her a song every day. At least she can say to you, you are a great whistler right I mean, and let me say something to you ladies that i hear from men all the time and then i have something for you men that for you ladies that i hear all the time here here's the thing uh, i was talking on many occasions and it's something let me just tell you something that kind of sounds right it says this wife what is it exactly what, what is it? how does he just never does nothing I said, such, such as? He, he does nothing. I said, come on, he does something. What do you, what do you mean he does nothing? Well, for instance, the dishwasher there, you know, it's full of dishes that have been clean. Do you think while I'm at work, he dares to open it up and put up the dishes so that when I get home, it's, it's empty, we can put it in there? Oh, so if he emptied the dishwasher, yeah, yeah. I looked at her and said, dude, empty the dishwasher. Just start out there, try it. So the next week you come back, you know, and uh, kind of waiting around on her to get there. And he, I look at him and say, how'd it go? He said, I emptied the dishwasher. I said, come on. He said, yeah. He said, I took every dish out, put them things up. I said, wow. I said, how'd that go? And the door opened. She came in. He said, ask her. I said, okay. I said, look, he was telling me he emptied the dishwasher. Oh, God, what a disaster. What? Yeah, he emptied it, but he didn't put a thing up where it belonged. He had, he had stuff stuffed everywhere. Guess how many times that dishwasher got uh, cleaned out? What are you saying? Ladies, listen to me. If, if, he, if, he, if you're complaining because he, he said he vacuumed, but it, you see more dirt, you say, man, I don't see nothing but dirt. You didn't vacuum. Do, do me a favor. Listen to this. If he puts the dishes in the wrong place, listen. When he, when he comes, he says, I helped you. I put the dishes up. Just look at him and say, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That was great help. Man, that's awesome. And when he leaves and he's no more around, you put them where they belong. If you've complained about him vacuuming, listen. You, you didn't, thank you so much for vacuuming. I appreciate that. And when he goes outside, because you're priming him to help you more than you are by criticizing him every time he tries. That's appreciation. It's, it's where you want to be. It's where you want to be. Man, I'm just telling you, appreciate, and it, and it grows its value. It really does. And, and that's what you want to be able to do. 
It, it, appreciation will actually put a spark back in your marriage because it raises the value of your home. It increases your love for each other. So how often do I need to do this? I've heard that. How many times do I need to do this? Well, the scripture says in Hebrews 3.13, it says, encourage one another daily. So I would say the minimum requirement is one compliment a day. And that would go across the board to others. So some of you who aren't married, don't think this is not applying to you because this helps the church grow and it helps Christians grow as well. But the minimum requirement would be one compliment a day. However, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that is the present participle. I'm going to check it out. If it is, it says keep on encouraging. So it's as often as you possibly can. And some of you, like I said, you have to get real creative uh, coming up with one compliment a day. But if you look for it, you'll find it. I'm just going to tell you well. When you raise the value of your mate, your husband, your wife, when you, when you love that husband or wife, it's not only good for them, but listen to me, this is the most important thing. It's a testimony to the world because it's a Christian witness. What do you mean? Well, if you look in Ephesians 5, the Bible says that a husband and a wife, their love for each other is an example of God's love for us in Christ. So a marriage is a reflection to the honor and glory of God of what that relation looks like. So it's not just something between me and you. Uh, you know, it, it's him. And it, he says that we need to keep that in mind as we go forth um, to be able to let him bring us into this world, as Ephesians 5 says, to demonstrate to the world that he is real. It's a good witness when husbands and wives are hopelessly in love with each other. When we're in hopelessly in love with each other, you see, that's a witness of the world. It, it proves the scripture to be true. So we need to ask God to help us build that into our marriage. So what should you appreciate? Well, how about the fact they've stuck with you? That was a text of my wife this morning when I left. I just texted her and I said, thank you for sticking with me all these years. You say, really? Yeah. She stuck with me before I was a believer in Christ, and that was a nightmare. And since I've been a Christian, it's an interesting little thing because as a pastor, your time's not always your time. And I know a lot of times she's taken a back seat, and a lot of times she has prayed with me and supported me at times being out all during the night and everything else. I, I just thought I said, thank you for sticking with me. I mean, I'm just appreciative of that. I really, really am. Or, or how about uh, uh, appreciating their efforts like I was just talking about, whether they meet your standards or not. At least they made the effort, right? So, so you're thankful for that. If you want to know what God's will is for your marriage, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Not for everything, but what? In everything. Give thanks. Give thanks. It's God's will that in everything you be appreciative. In everything you give thanks. That's God's will. So we want to accept one another. We want to uh, give each other a, the time and attention we need, submitting and adjusting one to another, forgiving one another, and encouraging one another. There's a sixth practice. And the first part of this sixth practice, and then I'm going to be through, applies to everybody in general who's a believer in Christ. The second part of that, it particularly belongs to uh, married couples. And I'm talking about the physical expression of love in your marriage. Physical expressions of love are vital to your overall spiritual help and to, uh, health and to relationships. Food is important for us to take in for our health, um, as well as physical contact uh, is to the emotions. It's indispensable to our emotional health. And that's what's so tragic about those who've been sexually abused and just can't stand anyone to touch them because of that. Because it is a necessary thing, and it was ruined by someone who inappropriately and sinfully touched them in a wrong way. And it really messes things up. We know that children who are deprived of physical love uh, have, grow to have emotional problems. It's just a fact. It, it's part of our health. And so in, in the normal ways for us, 
physical affection is a necessity. And I've seen this play out in a sad way since March of last year. Because we, we, we've been isolated. I've had couple after couple, sometimes up six and seven hours talking to couples who, who are, are stuck and, and yet they're afraid to get near each other. They don't want to give one sick and they're, they're, they're at their wits end. They don't know what to do. Churches shut down. Places are done. Schools. Parents are just like nuts because they're scared there's no touch. I mean, you know, there, there, there's no coming in. Hey, how you doing? You know, there's no patting on the back or nothing. Don't, don't, whoa, whoa. Don't get too close, right? I mean, it's there because we know the realities of, of this disease that's out there. But it doesn't nullify the fact that it has been detrimental for the mental and emotional health of people far beyond what COVID has done to others. I'm just telling you this. Suicides are crazy. People can't bear it because, uh, and the saddest thing, go see how many people in nursing homes have yet to have physical touch, a gentle kiss on the forehead from their family as they look through plexiglass or through a wind at family members who are wishing them a happy birthday. Or as I have been with a family who've been married a long time that can't go in a hospital with their loved one, and that loved one says, I don't want to go in the hospital because I don't want to be separated from my family. Is it necessary? I don't know. I think the people in the hospital leave the building. I think they leave and go home. I think they go places, but they come back in. It's in some way it seems that we could overcome that because I see from a pastor, I'm talking a pastor, mental and emotional stress is, is the saddest thing. I almost get sick on my stomach as I see those people stressing and distressing that they have not been able to touch or feel the touch of their family in over a year. Wade Rowett, Dr. Wade Rowett, who I had to prove to study under, he's just a great guy when I was at Southern. And his kids are about the age of my daughters, and they knew each other, I think, for a while. But uh, he was a PhD in counseling. He knew he loved the Lord, and he was a great counselor. And he said that at that time, and it's been years ago, he said, research has shown us that for a person to be emotionally and psychologically health, healthy, they need at least seven hugs a day. And I was just kind of shocked by that. I really was. Because like I said, there's some people that just can't, they weren't brought up in a touchy-feely thing and it makes them feel weird and I understand that. But the fact is, the research has shown that just from, non, from, from not just Christian, but non-Christian, say, it's essential. And so we all need that. I mean, that's, that's one of the saddest things. I mean, some just wave caution to the wind and do it anyway. But you know, you, you, you look at how it was... And you see how it is, and, and it's like that's a part of it that we miss. You know, you go in, you want to hug somebody, and somebody says, whoop, <laughs> bang, and, and it's just, wow, I miss, I miss that from this person. I miss that from this person. So generally, it, it, it is uh, a necessity, uh, a handshake, a hug, etc., is part of um, our, our need in mental health and emotional health. Now, the second part of this is particularly to marriage. And I want to say this as I read this particular scripture. This scripture is used by men to club their wives. I think it's the only verse that some men have ever memorized in their life. And they've memorized it and they quote it because I've been in the sessions where the wife says, if he quotes that verse one more time, he's going to be missing teeth. But it is. And I just say to you men, stop it. And I'm going to read this verse, and then I'm going to explain a couple of things. Okay? It's in 1 Corinthians 7. It's verses 3 through 5. 
The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to the husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent, then only for a brief time, so that you can devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so though Satan will not tempt you because you lack self-control. Now, Paul here says uh, three things about physical intimacy. He says that it's a legitimate need, it's a mutual benefit, uh, and it is a spiritual responsibility. Uh, and there are men who quote that all the time to their wives as if if you don't do what this verse says, you're a sinner against God. Lie. I'm tell you why. First of all, men and a growing number of women, you need to get rid of the porn in your life. It belongs in no Christian man or a Christian woman's life, no matter if it's called soft or hard, it belongs nowhere in your life. And if you've got a problem with it, you need to repent of it, and we'll be glad to help you, uh, Rodney and myself, get help to get, get by on that because that is a sinful thing that minimizes and dehumanizes people to a means to an end, and it is a sinful thing when we allow it to inflame us uh, to desire and do things that really we don't. Because how many of you know there's such things as cancer? There are such things as other physical problems and ailments that come in that prevent that thing from going on and that thing from happening? No, it does. There's a lot of things that goes in. And it does, we need to be able to what? Consider one another before we consider ourselves, first of all. And understand that the principle is this. There are people out there who have what I call vulnerability radar. They can spot it. There are men out there that can spot a woman who is vulnerable in her, her relationships. And they, it's like bing, bing, bang, bang, and they come flying in like a bat out of you know where. And they say, mm, I'll listen to you. And there's women who do the same thing. They got the vulnerability radar up and they pick it up. And, and what this verse is really about is that you provide, and all we can do this is to be able to talk with each other. You provide the intimacy that is needed as I said, everybody needs hugs. One of the, you want me to tell you the most tender, intimate scene that I, that I have seen in, in my life happened, I think it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I don't know how many of you saw it. There's a couple been married over 70 years. Died 19 seconds apart holding hands. I said, man, that's it. That, that's where it's at right there. I just want to be with you, you know. I, I mean, if you've ever watched that, what's that show, The Notebook? I mean, me and Janet think that'd be the best way in the world, man. Just be, be there together and leave here together. It, it, that, to me, is, is where it's at. It's not the other way. It's not putting that down. It's just that there's too many men use that as a club, not wanting to understand the physical state that their wife may be in. Uh, so I want to make that clear. This is to prevent the devil from what? Getting a foothold in your marriage. Because I'll tell you something. He will come at you where he thinks you are the weakest or you've got yourself in a, a jam. He'll come there. And he will enter in and he'll take everything in your life away from you. Resist him and he will flee. Now, somebody asked me, what is it that makes a marriage Christian? Well, I will say this. You can both be Christians and not have a Christian marriage. Because a Christian marriage is a marriage where there's two people who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord and who follow, flesh out, live out 
his teachings. They love one another. They're able to accept one another even as they've been accepted by Jesus. They submit to one another. They encourage one another. They show affection to one another. And they have invited, secondly, the Holy Spirit to help them make Jesus Lord, not only of their own life, but of their marriage, to be literally dwelling with them in their relationship. And they put and have as an overarching banner in their relationship, as all of us who are believers should have, Philippians 2, 4, and 5. I just quoted it a moment ago. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. I can't think of a verse that applies more to marriage than that verse right there. Each of you should not only think of yourself, but also the interests of, interests of your husband or wife. I mean, if we'd follow that verse, the number of problems we would have be much, much smaller. I believe that with all my heart, both generally in the church and in particularly in our marriages. Why? Because this is what Paul said too. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. If he's living in you, it should be your attitude toward each other and toward him. So the bottom line is you treat your spouse, your husband, your wife the way Jesus would. And that's what it means to have a Christian marriage. So, so where are you? Do you know Jesus? You see, that's, that's the starting point. And you'd be surprised, folks, when I ask people, do you know Jesus? I say, yeah. But when I pursue it, they don't. I was either baptized as a baby, and so, yeah, I've been a Christian since I was a baby. And some people say, yeah, I've been a, I, 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 you know, I've always gone to church, I've read my Bible, blah, blah, blah. Listen to me, folks. There's only one way to be a believer in Christ, a Christian, and that is to recognize you can't save yourself and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father but by him. And you turn from your past and trust him as Savior and as Lord. He is the only way. There are not multiple ways. He's the only way. And that's the beginning. I mean, that's the first thing I try to talk to people about who want to get married. It's, it's the thing that I, I want to talk about with people who are having problems with each other who are Christians. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We know Christ. And if that is something you don't, today, he says, if you call upon his name, you will be saved. But I ask all of you in here, how accepting are you of others as Christ accepts you? How, if you're married, how accepting of your husband? How accepting of your wife are you as Christ has accept you? How about the time and attention? Do you long to have that time and attention at marriage? Do you long to have that time and attention with other believers? You know, how, how about adjustment? Are you willing to adjust to others or do you just write them off because they're not like you or you think you may have it all together and they don't? How about forgiveness? Are you living in forgiveness and resentment or are you, are you uh, letting all that go? How about appreciation? Can you find something to encourage your husband or wife with or other believers who are needing it? You answer those things. God designed, he created, he instituted marriage. And in the Bible, he outlines the truths and the principles and the practices that make for a lasting relationship. And, and it's a choice. And you and I every day get to make the choice. We either do it his way, we do it our way, or the culture's way. I'm telling you, his way always is better. Always. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father God, in Christ's name, I, I thank you so much for your love and your grace. On this Valentine's Day, Father, I thank you for every person that's in this place, for their patience to let me preach your word and to share that word all these years. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that everything does change in, the, in your presence. And I pray that right now there'd be some lives changed in your presence. I'm praying that there'd be some who've never trusted in you, Jesus. They, 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 if they ask him, how, how, what are you going to say to Jesus when he says, why should I let you in? They would answer, well, I've been a pretty good person. Or they have answered this way, Father, I'm praying that right now those individuals would hear you knocking on the door and knowing, man, it's you and you alone, Jesus. And if that's you that is listening to me pray, I'm just asking you, 
turn away from what it is you're trusting in and today lay it all on the line go all in with Jesus just call on him help me Jesus forgive me I, I can't save myself I have no hope without you and I don't understand it all but I'm asking you to save me tell him some way in your own words ask him to save you to forgive you to make you his child to make heaven your home believe in your heart and confess in your mouth and he says you will be saved do that and then tell someone tell someone who's a believer so they can pray for you let us know so we can pray for you and help you in any way we can to grow in your faith father i'm praying for some that maybe they started hearing this message and they cut it off maybe some want to get it far away from it as well because maybe their marriage is really in a deep bind and they don't know <clears throat> but god i know this you're you major in resurrection thing no no relationship so dead you can't resurrect it if there's two people willing to make that choice so i'm asking you, father all the believers in here you know it you know exactly where we are whether we're married or whether we're not whether we're accepting others uh, as you've accepted us or whether we're accepting our husband or our wife even as you've accepted us you you know whether we father are spending time and loving them with all our heart and soul you know whether we long to spend time with others with our husband or wife you you know whether we're adjusting or whether we're just hoping they're going to adjust you know all these things father and so i'm just asking that right now you'd help some believers some couples just lay it all down some need to just let go forgive and let go of the resentment just let it go and leave you today free so they can go on with their life and live their life full in your blessing i'm just praying god right now there'll be some people letting down some things and picking you up making new and fresh commitment to you to follow you and I ask you to bless their marriage and I ask you to I ask you to help them to grow in in their faith and their trust to you for those who have gone through the pains of divorce I ask you God to heal them to comfort them to help them dear father take care of business and themselves so that they won't repeat anything down the road I ask you father that you be glorified in our life I'm praying God that we'll all be able to know what it is to have a love that lasts a lifetime even if that only love that we have is your love for us we thank you that it'll last eternity now god on this valentine's day i ask you to help us see that the only valentine card that ever mattered was a cross on a hill and i thank you for that i ask you to bless these people i ask you to bless virginia Pendleton. i ask you to help her can just heal her and give her strength so that her and Max can continue to enjoy each other. I just give you praise and glory for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Hope you have a